three, two, one. One thing he said is that Allah, specifically the Muslim God, is the most violent form of God he could ever imagine. Really? And I, was, it, I literally responded to him, you have a very poor imagination. Because uh-huh. you know, I could easily imagine that God way more violent than... You know. But what would your response to, to, to an argument like that be? Is Islam's God the most violent form of God you have seen within religions around the world? Or you can possibly imagine yourself? I don't know. I feel like... I don't want to, like, take shots at anyone, but I feel like the God of the Old Testament is, like, very kind of, like, intense. Um, the Greek gods are pretty bad, too. Um, but, like, the, the God of the Quran, like Allah, he starts off 113 out of 114, like, surahs, 113 out of 114 chapters of the Quran by emphasizing that he's, like, the most compassionate, the most merciful, right? It's also interesting because... Scholars normally divide up the qualities of God into two different qualities. That of the Jamali and that of the Jalali. That of Allah's beauty and that of Allah's... Jalal would be like majesty, right? And we see both of these qualities in human beings, right? And it's good for human beings to model the beautiful qualities of God. And it's also good in some circumstances for human beings to model the qualities of majesty, right? If someone is beating up my little sister, I'm not going to be Jamali with them. I'm going to be Jalali with them, right? But some of these qualities are only reserved for God. Like human beings can't be boastful, right? Like things like this. But it's interesting that 113 out of 114 chapters of the Quran start not with God, you know, mentioning one of each of these two categories. God could say like, in the name of God, the most compassionate the punisher, or in the name of God, the most passionate, I mean, the most compassionate, the most just, right? But Allah says in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. And another verse in the Quran, Allah says, my my mercy outweighs my wrath. And even just the notion of rahmah, just the notion of mercy in itself, like in the Basmalah, in verses of Bismillah, Rahman, and Rahim, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, they both come from the same root word, emphasizing mercy, and Allah is like told to like emphasize as merciful. Um, that's like the leading quality of God throughout the Quran in every single kind of chapter. And then the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, the most important verse with regard to him is well, you have only been sent. Uh, Allah is saying to the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, that we have only sent you as a mercy to everything that exists. And oftentimes this is translated as mankind, but al alamin literally means everything in existence. Razi, who's like a very famous commentator on the Quran, when he was asked, what, is it, what does the word Al-Alameen mean? He says, Kul shayun il- everything except for Allah. That's what Al-Alameen is. So the Prophet Muhammad is described as a mercy to every single thing that exists. Not just to human beings, to trees, to all of that. So God is merciful in the Quran. That's his kind of most emphasized quality. The Prophet Muhammad is emphasized as a mercy to everything that exists. God is merciful, the Prophet is merciful. And the Prophet is even told that if you are harsh with the people, they wouldn't have followed you. He's told that you are not sent as a cursor or all of this sort of stuff, but you are sent as a mercy, right? So God is merciful, the Prophet is merciful. And then the most important kind of saying of the Prophet that's a command to us is, Rahimuni irhamu ar-Rahman, irhamu man fil ardi, irhamu man fil samai. So it's said, the, the merciful, God, shows mercy to those who show mercy. And then it says, show mercy to those on earth, and the one in the heavens, God, will send mercy upon you. So the, the God is described, his leading quality is that of mercy. The prophet is merciful, and we as human beings are commanded to be merciful. And even if you look at like the life of the prophet, he's someone who is of immense mercy. One of the examples of this is when the Muslims conquer Mecca, and the conquer of Mecca is very peaceful. And the Prophet Muhammad and his followers, some of them are murdered. Most of them are forced to like flee the city and go to Medina. They're fo- forced to migrate away. And when they come back, they take away, they take the city peacefully. And this is something agreed upon. This isn't just Muslims saying this, but this is just like a historical fact. And there are a group of people who are called the, the Tulaqa. What the word Tulaq means is, Tulaq in Arabic means like divorce, divorce right? Yeah. But what divorce really means is to free someone of a contract, right? So 
marriage is seen as a contract and luck is seen as like the freeing of that contract, kind of like a termination, right? So in the conquest of Mecca, the enemies of the Prophet who have like fought wars against him and all this sort of stuff, they actually end up being freed. And many of them end up converting to Islam. And they end up becoming Muslims and they end up living their last few years with the Prophet Muhammad Islam and being some of his like closest followers. People like Abu Sufyan radiallahu anhu, right? He's someone who fought wars against the Muslims and later on he becomes very close to the Prophet. And we see this in many examples of some of the Prophet's closest confidants and closest people were people who at one time wanted to like kill him. His, and his, one of his best friends was initially trying to kill him before he converted to Islam. Yeah. yeah. And then the Prophet Muhammad, by the end, like later on, he says that if there was a Prophet after me, it would be Umar. Except there's no Prophet after me, right? He's the one who has the immense honor now of being buried right next to the Prophet as like one of his closest friends. And this would not have happened were it not for like the merciful nature of the Prophet Muhammad And it goes back to this idea of God being merciful. So to kind of answer that question, I would not only say that the God of the Quran is merciful, that... Allah is merciful, but also that the Prophet is someone who is merciful and someone who taught us to be merciful and also like commanded us to be merciful. And this is probably one of the most important qualities of Islam. It's to a point yeah. where God said, كَتَبَ عَلَى نَفْسِي الرَّحْمَةِ he, he swore upon himself, he wrote upon himself mercy. And like you said, God chooses compassion over mercy. And then God in other places has said that he created humanity so that he can have mercy on us, so that he can forgive us, so that he can... Uh, and, and in other places, God says how he, uh, uh, or the Prophet, peace be upon him, tells us how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala boasts to the angels, or uh, God loves when he sees his blessings on his servant and his servant enjoying it. You know, right. we have such a kind and, and, and beautiful God, and one of the biggest examples of that, indicators of that, is children. You look at children, they're fresh out, fresh out the oven. They were just in that spiritual world look how amazing they are look how clean they are it just they're so much better than us there's also this is actually also a really good question that like the person asks because a lot of muslims also don't recognize this like oftentimes even the way muslims worship it'll be like oh if i don't pray i'm gonna go to hell right and there's a, a famous saying of, of ali ibn abi talib anhu, where he says i don't want to be someone who who worships like a slave out of fear of punishment, right? He says this is the worship of a slave. Slaves do things because they do things out of fear of punishment, right? And then he says that I don't want to be someone who worships like a merchant out of desire for something in return, right? And these are the people who, who worship wanting to go to heaven, right? And then he says I want to be someone who worships like a wali, who worships like a friend. And this is someone who worships with the objective of knowing Allah. So these are kind of considered the, the three levels of worship. The lowest level of worship is that of like praying out of fear of, of hell. And this is seen as the worship of a slave. Because slaves do things because they fear punishment of like the master or of the slaveholder, you could say. And merchants, the second level, is worshiping out of desire for heaven. And this is seen as the worship of a merchant. Like, you give me this, I'll give you that. I will pray and you give me heaven, right? And then he says the worship of a, of a wali, of a trusted friend, is to worship God in order to know Him. And Sheikh Nuk Heller, who's a scholar in Jordan, he says that all three of these levels are valid, right? It's not wrong to do any of the three. All of them are good, but one is better than the other, and one is better than the other two, right? And in life, we might see ourselves like oscillating between these three different ways of worshiping. Probably even within a five-day prayer series, you'll be a slave once and a wedi once. And a... <laughs> yeah. yeah, but this is kind of like the aspiration. And it goes back to that notion of like experiential knowledge. That prayer is not something that we only do to exonerate ourselves or to like get something, but it's also a means of like knowledge acquisition for us. That it's through these experiential actions that we come to know God. And one, one last thing for you that, that I'm curious about. What did you find most troubling or what did you struggle most about one of the principles, beliefs, ideologies of Islam growing up? That's an interesting question. I think one of them was like this idea of, I think this is a common issue that people have, is that you want every single thing in one ideological system to correlate with Islam, right? So if you want Islam to correlate with like liberalism, 
you're going to find conflicts, right? And you need to understand that if you want Islam to correlate with like conservatism, you're also going to find conflicts, right? So this idea that Islam is neither right nor left. Um, the Prophet is something who's above these kind of modern dichotomies of ideological systems. If you give me an ideological system, I can find you a way in which the Qur'an and Sunnah, the Qur'an and the life example of the Prophet contradict that. And that's because every single man-made ideology is flawed, even if there's a lot of good that lies within these man-made ideologies. But a lot of people have this issue where they want to superimpose some man-made ideology on Islam, and we need to understand that we need to apply an Islamic critique to these ideologies as opposed to a critique of these ideologies to Islam. Because we believe that if you can rationally come to the conclusion that these things are the word of God, then they are true, right? And any kind of human desire to come to something is going to have flaws in it, right? So you should critique that which has flaws with that which is true. You shouldn't critique that which is true with that which is flawed. Right. Yeah. And I think that's also like an important thing because like in the modern imagination of religion, religion isn't something that you come to a rational conclusion about, right? People often talk about the notion of faith. But in Islam, we're told, Afala taqilun. Do you not use your intellects, right? So one really needs to have like the right like intellectual grounding to come to these conclusions. Uh, that's what yeah. makes it difficult f- sometimes for us Muslims to be able to, to, to talk to uh, our Christian counterparts or Jewish counterparts. Because their, their very ideologies about God, are, are the principal ideologies about God that they have are in- completely different than ours. Yeah. yeah, it's also interesting because oftentimes Muslims will be very excited, right? And they'll be like, oh, you know, the Trinity doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to talk to a Christian about why it doesn't make sense. And you'll talk to this Christian and they'll be like, yeah, God's difficult to understand. And that's kind of the end of the conversation because like, like yeah. yeah, I have a difficult time as well. <laughs> yeah, God. they'll be like, but I have faith in the fact that it's true. And that's okay in their religious imagination. Like your religious beliefs don't have to be necessarily Logical. intellectually ver- verified. Yeah. Whereas for Muslims, like this is kind of an interesting view, but what's his name? Sanusi, who is like a Islamic, very famous like Islamic theologian. He was asked the question of, what do you do with a, a Muslim who, when you ask them why they're Muslim, they say that I'm Muslim because my parents are Muslim? Like, what is the status for such a person? And Sanusi says that we can treat them as Muslims in this life. Like, in terms of, like, you know, they can lead the prayer, they can marry Muslims, they can take part in Islamic marriage ceremonies, like, all this sort of stuff. But he says that no, on the Day of Judgment, that when they are asked by Allah, their, their reasoning for their beliefs, and they say that I'm, we're Muslims because, you know, our families were. He says that no, they are no different than the idol worshippers of Mecca, who when they were asked why they worship idols, they said we worship these idols because our fathers used to. So he basically says that they'll be resurrected on the Day of Judgment as like kufar, as like disbelievers. Hopefully Sanusi is not right and these people also go to heaven. <laughs> but uh, this shows the importance in Islam of using the intellect. And this is also another interesting thing about like the modern world. Oftentimes we assume that in the modern world, we are more rational than we used to be. But if you look at the way that even people in like the Western world used to talk about religion in like the 1400s or the 1500s, and people talk about religion now, before religion was something in which rational inquiry was encouraged. And now in the modern world, it's it's not the same. So in with regard to religion, Modernity is actually like less rational than pre-modernity. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Uh...